Tonight, before we begin a more formal study of the Pythagorean doctrine of numbers, I'd like to point out a number of points which perhaps have caused confusion in the public mind. Pythagoras used number symbols almost exclusively as hieroglyphical figures to represent essential phases of universal law. It is not known to what degree he was involved in what we call today numerology. It is not certain that Pythagoras himself practiced divination by numbers. It is possible that he did so but by no means is it proven. The scanty records that have survived would seem to indicate that numerology developed considerably later and sometime after the death of Pythagoras and his legitimate disciples. The association between letters and numbers is possible in the Greek alphabet in which letters are used in pagination and in place of numbers in many instances. We know there is a peculiar divinatory device called the Wheel of Pythagoras which shows apparently the numerical equivalent of letters and uh, vice versa. This wheel, though attributed to him, is not with absolute certainty associated with his name. He is said to have possessed a wheel of letters and numbers. But whether that which has survived is authentic, we do not know. It would not be likely uh, that the Pythagoreans would have used numerology in the popular way in which we have been inclined to employ it. It is more likely that this system developed after the decline of the great philosophical schools. The uh, relation between letters and numbers exists not only among the Greeks, but in various parts of Asia. And a Kabbalah of number-letter associations will be found in a number of systems. But we cannot say with certainty that our present numerology is Pythagorean. Nor can we bridge the unfortunate difficulty of language changes inasmuch as the letters of our alphabet do not correspond with those of the Greek closely enough to justify uh, following their rule and transposing it to our modern alphabet. Thus we may say that numerology in the practical or popular sense of the term is an entirely different matter and should not be confused with the Pythagorean symbolism of number. To them, number was a very sacred mystery to be used only in the exploration of the great science of wisdom or the great art of knowing truth. Thus we cannot confuse them nor can we necessarily discredit the possibility that Pythagoras did have some divinatory concept the Greeks practiced many forms of divination in his time, and it was customary and usual to form oracles in a number of ways, including from the flight of birds, from the gathering of clouds, from the changing of winds, from the entrails of sacrificed animals, and in many other manners. <coughs> Pythagoras was accredited with knowing the future, with having a tremendous internal mystical apperceptive power. 
Therefore, many legends have gathered around him, and many arts and beliefs have been attributed to him. There was a period during the medieval era in human history in which a great number of books were fabricated and attributed to ancient authors. Among these, we might note in passing Aristotle's supposed essay on midwifery, which is not quite authentic. We may also put under the same heading the mysterious sixth and seventh books of Moses, of which the prophet undoubtedly knew nothing. Yet there was a time when catchpenny productions had fascination for the public mind, and wonderful names were associated with some very bad work. This all adds up to these points which we wish to make. Theon of Smyrna, the one of the earliest and greatest of the Pythagoreans, does not mention divination in his great thesis on numbers. It would seem that he might have done so had it been part of the original system. It is not recorded by Iamblichus in his life of Pythagoras, nor is it reported by Plato, although he makes use of a Pythagorean number. We do, however, find comparatively early evidence of numerical speculation in relation to divination, but little prior to the 8th or 9th century, so A.D. So we have these problems which we merely point out in passing. Now for the convenience of those who are interested in classifying materials, I have tried to work out a very simple keyword system as to the Pythagorean approach to number. And as the Pythagoreans particularly use number in connection with archetype or the monadal forms of number, I have followed their system and have selected one word which as far as possible summarizes at least a phase of their association between number and power. And therefore, those of you who are interested, I read off this list to you rather slowly so you can copy it if you would want to do so. This is merely a keyword analogy, but perhaps it will assist us in the further discussion of the subject. We will use their form then, instead of the one, we will say the monad. And perhaps the nearest thing to a key word is identity. Now, in using it as a key word, we summarize Pythagorean statements such as the numeral of fameness or that number which is without dissimilarity or that number which alone knows itself. Many such statements as this seem to carry the general tone of identity with the several meanings of this word. Our own identity is our own monad. Uh, the identity in things represents not only themselves as identified, but also common identity. That the same selfness in each is to be regarded as an identity with all other selfness. So in terms, those things which are of a causal nature approaching the throne of deity are said to possess identity. Identity with self. Identity with all self. Identity with deity. And the uh, numeral or the numeration, the monad, carries this thought. The number two or the duad, more completely, 
is the Pythagorean symbol of this similarity. We have already implied that they regarded it as an ill number. They did so because it represents things about which differences are to be noted. It is a number of illusion because difference is illusionary. It is a number of ignorance because illusion, particularly the illusion of separateness, is the root of ignorance. Ignorance is therefore transformed into wisdom to the degree that unity is brought out of division. Therefore, perhaps also the Pythagorean term chaos is appropriate to the duad, whereas cosmos would be more appropriate to the monad. Therefore, this similarity is not only essential difference, but the acceptance by the mind of the appearance of difference. This similarity also includes comparison, for by means of it we are tempted to elevate parts above each other and to attempt to achieve to a comprehension of good without overcoming the primary evil which is division. Therefore, of two or more things we may say this is good, this is better, this is best. Yet none of these three can be best because only the one can be best. Anything that is not the one cannot be elevated to a superlative position. Elevation, therefore, in Pythagorean thinking is motion toward unity. And things divided cannot be supreme, although because of the imbalance of divided parts, one may be greater or lesser than another. Yet always, totality alone is superior to parts. Consequently, the duet, as a symbol of separation, becomes a proper emblem of man's division from truth, and separation is appropriately the symbol of interval. Interval between objects is measured in distance. Interval between qualities is measured qualitatively. But wherever interval or distance exists, the duad is inevitable. All lines must have ends. All separate things must have intervals, and if intervals shall cease, separation shall cease. Therefore, interval becomes the great abyss which man must cross in his effort to be restored to a universal state. To be divided from God is to exist in a state of separation from reality, and separation is a state dissimilar. Thus, in the Pythagorean thinking, among the key words which they themselves have left is this word dissimilarity, which I think conveys a great deal if we want to think about it. We hope that each one of you will think about these words later and see how they are the elements of a very profound series of speculations concerning the nature of being and illusion. Now the third number, or the archetypal triad, or equivalent to the number three, was to the Pythagoreans the symbol of wisdom. Why is it the symbol of wisdom? Because wisdom is moderation. And moderation is between extremes. Therefore, out of the concept of extremes and moderation, we develop a trident or a three-pronged instrument. 
in which the middle point is equidistant from the extremity. This point is wisdom, because wisdom is equidistant from all extremities. Extremities, as we told you in an earlier lecture, are always represented as phases of dissimilarity, therefore are essentially negative. We do not say that good is opposed to evil. This is a dissimilarity that is illusional. We say that two evil, evils are opposed to each other and that between them is a point of equilibrium which is truth or reality. Therefore, the Sinocephalus ape in Egypt, the symbol of the human mind, is always seated on the beam of the balance of judgment in order that it may represent equilibrium. Wisdom is equilibrium of mind. Wisdom is the ability of the individual to reconcile divided parts by reason. It therefore such divisions as appear to exist in nature are overcome by the rational power of man, who is able to discover unity as a spiritual experience. To discover unity is to reconcile opposites. And all opposites are, rec are reconciled in a neutral state, or a state in which no polarity dominates. Wisdom, then, is equidistant between two kinds of ignorance. Ignorance and wisdom are not opposites, because there are two kinds of ignorance. The first, the state of unknowing and the second, the state of false knowing. These two, then, must both be reconciled. That which is not knowing must be elevated. That which is wrong knowing must be dissipated or reduced to a common ground. In the same way, virtue is in equilibrium between vices. For there are vices of excess and vices of privation. Each individual, for instance, in an economic situation, can have too much or too little. Both of these extremes are unfortunate. Moderation is fortunate. We also observe that great fortune frequently destroys. Great misfortune frequently perfects. Thus, we cannot place any polarity in this way. Wisdom is the reconciler, the ordinator. Wisdom is represented by triad, because in these we have balance, and a triangle is a balanced form, and is the least form which can enclose an area, the circle always being infinite form. Thus the triangle, if it be equilateral, represents also the primary parts of man, consciousness, intelligence, and force in equilibrium. And these together constitute wisdom. For if wisdom is, as Socrates said, the recognition of the one, the beautiful, and the good. Then it represents a balance in which no part can be deficient without destroying all. Virtues were therefore regarded as triads. The greatest of all virtues is wisdom, because wisdom is the virtue which perfects or makes possible the rational discovery of truth. Thus the term wisdom is appropriate to the triad. Now the next one is a little difficult, but uh, it requires a discrimination on the part of the student. For the four, or the tetrad, archetypally speaking, is the Pythagorean symbol of intellect, 
and we come for a moment to pause and consider the difference between wisdom and intellect. We must make this discrimination at this point. The four, in its largest sense of the word, was what the Pythagoreans called the little holy number. And among many ancient people, the four was the symbol of God. The four is the fourth number. If considered in a sequence, following the tetractus, or the groups of dots, the one plus the two plus the three plus the four equals the ten. And as the ten is the most sacred of all numbers, four represents the least number by which the ten can be produced by mathematical sequence or simple addition. Four, therefore, carries with it the symbolism of the forces or powers in the universe by which the material creation was brought into existence. The four, therefore, it was also called the demiurgic number or the number of the mental or intellectual regions of the universe. Following the Orphic theology, to which we must refer at this time, we recognize a, a, a hierarchy or a descent of deities. We know, for example, that the Orphics represented the supreme being under the name of Uranus, or heaven that Uranus in turn lost the kingdom to Cronus, the god of time. And Cronus in turn was dethroned by his own son, Zeus. Zeus, or the Latin Jupiter, thus becomes the demiurgic power. For according to the Greeks, it was Zeus who created the mundane universe and is embodied in it. Uranus created the spiritual universe. Saturn created the psychic or soul universe. And Zeus created the mundane or material world. And therefore, this great material creation is the body of the Demiurgus or the lord of the cosmocrators, or creators of the world. This Zeus is then the third person of a creative triad, and is the power which represents the active principle in nature. The universe being created by will, which is spirit, wisdom, which is the psychic nature, and action, which is the material power, uh, Zeus, or Saturn, uh, Zeus or Jupiter represents the active or objective principle, or the emergence of life from and in form. Thus he is called the formator, and is so recognized in most systems. Among 72 different peoples, according to the Kabbalah, the name of the deity responsible for creation contains four letters or characters. These letters or characters are called in the Hebrew form the tetragrammaton, or the name of four letters. And this always implies the third logos or the creating power of the material universe. The uh, ancients generally regarded and revered the number four because it represented the elements, the direction, and of course, when presented in cruciform, represents the four arms of a cross, either an <coughs> actual cross or a St. Andrew's cross. The cross was, of course, the symbol of matter, or of materiality, and it is therefore the cross upon which the Logos, or the Christos, is crucified. 
The cross represents the material world and also body and the four instruments of science or knowledge. Uh, for the Pythagoreans held that man possesses four powers uh, by means of which he is capable of, of orienting himself in the material world. We say intellect is different from wisdom inasmuch as man can think, but thinking does not necessarily imply the achievement of wisdom. The world intellect corresponds to the concrete mind of man. Therefore, the number four represents mind focused in matter, and this is termed intellect. Whereas the number three represents mind focused in a superior state, therefore abstract or creative mind. Intellect rationalizes, but wisdom is not possible without understanding, and understanding implies the living, vital experience of a thing. The mind, therefore, contemplates. Wisdom is the production of contemplation plus internal experience or apperception through psychic power within man's own nature. Wisdom is a state of knowing, whereas the intellect leads to remembering, to thinking, and may also end in dispute or dissension. By mind, man builds the world. By wisdom, he perfects himself. They are not the same thing although in many respects they may appear to be quite similar. Wisdom represents an attribute of God. Mind represents a limited manifestation of this attribute in man or in some created being having a separate intellectual nature. The Greeks, therefore, used two terms to represent wisdom and intellect. One of these was intelligible and the other intellectual. Intelligible being or knowing is that in which knowledge is inherent and cannot be separated. An intellectual being is one in which knowledge must be acquired or must be the result of some process apart from inherently. Thus, certain orders of superior being, beings are intelligible because they move from a source of wisdom within themselves, whereas man is an intellectual because he moves toward a source of wisdom about which and of which he is not yet able to know completely or perfectly. The intellect aspires to attain wisdom. Uh, the wisdom principle itself is therefore an end of intellect. When we say the intellect brings with it the possibility of wisdom, we then clearly distinguish between the two states. An individual who has remembered a well-known uh, scientific thesis may be called intelligent but he is not necessarily wise. For wisdom is a dynamic. Wisdom is much more than thought. Wisdom is possible be because man is capable of attaining it. But we may say with Pythagoras that wisdom is archetypal and exists whether there is anyone to know it or not. Thus, Intellect depends upon wisdom, but wisdom does not depend upon intellect. Wisdom is a reality in itself. It can perhaps be aspired to by intellect. Whether there be a mind or not, truth remains. 
And this is the essential difference between the power of the triad and the power of the tetrad. The archetypal five is called the pentad, and this is the symbol of equilibrium in a little different way. The triad is wisdom. The pentad is equilibrium in function or in existence. It is a balance of forces rather than a state of consciousness. All forces and elements in nature strive toward equilibrium. In creatures with certain spiritual endowments, this equilibrium may result in wisdom. But in creatures of another kind, or in orders of life different from those we recognize, uh, there is what is termed equilibrium. And equilibrium is the bringing of dissimilars into patterns, not involving necessarily the dissolution of illusion, but the arrangement of things harmonically or into ordered patterns. The number five is particularly, therefore, the balance of power in nature. Nature is forever striving against excess. It is forever trying to force one group of circumstances against another so that nothing will predominate. An example of this, I think, is one that I probably have told you before, but it deals with a natural problem and is appropriate at this time. Experiments were made, for example, on a certain isolated mesa in the southwest of the United States to try to create an ideal setting for the development of certain kinds of creatures. Because it was almost inaccessible, animal life on this mesa could be rigidly controlled. A group of kindly and friendly animals, who is exact, a herd of deer, was brought to this place, and every animal known to be detrimental to them, and every other form of life which they had reason to fear, was removed so that they could do exactly what they pleased. They all died. Uh, they found that the very forms of life which in many ways hazarded the deer and its survival also kept a kind of balance among themselves and that the removal of these destructive forces removed also constructive forces which could not be separated from them. And so by degrees, the balance of nature was destroyed. And by destroying the balance, the very, creature uh, the very creatures we thought to save were themselves eliminated. We know this is also psychologically true in the case of the human being. There are persons who in a great spirit of kindliness try to prevent others from suffering. If they succeed, they generally destroy the other person. In attempts to save children from the necessary experiences of living, for example, we do not preserve purity, so we simply weaken character, and the child becomes incapable of meeting the problems of life effectively. Nature is forever working for an equilibrium, a maintenance of balance, a man, regardless of his good intention, frequently interferes with this equilibrium. So the Pythagoreans, way back at that time, recognized the affinity between the number five and man, as assuming and affirming, therefore, that the number five was also the symbol of the hierophant, 
or the master of the mysteries. The higher elephant, of course, being man, the master of nature. Therefore, that it was essential to the place of man in nature that he should strive ever to preserve and advance the equilibrium of the environment in which he existed. This equilibrium not only assured a better world around him, but preserved him. The man exists only because of a balance of forces. If this balance is too gravely disturbed, man will destroy himself, a message which might have some interest to atomic thinkers these days. The universe is therefore appropriately represented in its natural equilibrium by the number five. And this number, because of its relationship uh, to man himself, was represented as an upright five-pointed star, the points being composed of the head, the arms, and the legs. This became a magic symbol and was used for the Kabbalists and the later magicians throughout the medieval world. Pythagoras is said to have worn a ring carrying upon it the pentalpha or five-pointed star. This was the symbol of healing because the purpose of healing is achieved by the restoration of equilibrium. All sickness is an imbalance some kind. This imbalance may be due to chemical deficiency, but the moment the balance of parts is destroyed, the, the security of the compound is in danger. Creation remains together because of an intricate pattern of balance. And if any one of these is disturbed, a chain reaction sets in which threatens the survival of anything and everything else. One of the old Pythagoreans said that if man could destroy a grain of sand, he would ultimately destroy himself. Because that chain reaction would lead finally to the absolute annihilation of the world. And he would only have to destroy one grain of sand. But, of course, the answer lies that he cannot do it. That the equilibrium is therefore indestructible. But man does have the power, as the hierarchy, of assailing or, uh, or endangering this balance. And the Pythagorean symbol of health, therefore, was to restore balance restore the balance in relationships in life, to recognize that every inward attribute must be balanced with a manifestation, that words without works are dead, that there cannot be too much of an intake without some giving out or there will be trouble, that nutrition not only requires food but also exercise and the use of energy. But wherever there is a blocking or a stopping of the flow of universal life, survival is threatened. Therefore, health, peace, security, world good are appropriately symbolized by the star, which even in the time of Pythagoras was also called hope, inasmuch as to them Hope was the promise of good things for those who kept the law. Anyone who did well had a good hope. For hope is nothing more than man's reasonable expectation that that which is good will produce good. Equilibrium and balance maintain all of these things. Now, there is a difference between, again, the five and the six, but it is subtle, like the difference between the four and the five. Because the six, according to Pythagoras, the heptad, was called the number 
of harmony. Harmony is, again, a kind of order. But harmony is not so much concerned merely with balance. Harmony contains many other attributes, of which perhaps the most important is motion. Harmony, whether it be of sound or of movement or of color, implies certain motion and a certain vibratory relationship. Uh, equilibrium is the balance of things. Harmony is the equilibrium of things within themselves rather than in their relation to other things. The six, of course, to the Pythagoreans was also the number of creation. Creation being, of course, essentially and primarily the manifestation of universal law through the harmonic of generation. So the number six, being composed of two interlaced triangles, one upright and the other inverted, forming a six-pointed star known to the Hebrew Kabbalists as the Shield of David. This symbol was the symbol of union, in the sense of the union of generation. It was the symbol of the generating of the universe. And according to the Pythagoreans, therefore, it was called marriage. It was called union of the positive and negative principles of life. In the Bible, the Old Testament, we hear of the six days of creation and the seventh day upon which deity rested. In six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Six was therefore the number of labor, and the great labor was creation. And creation is the primary work of being, and it is also the primary labor of man. For all things fulfill through creation. And the archetype of creation is the creative act of God itself, or the supreme power. Thus, in the principle of creativity, we also find harmony. Why harmony and creation are linked together by the Pythagoreans may be a little bit obscure. But I think the answer lies in their recognition that creation is order or harmonic motion. Creation is a sequential unfoldment or ideation of things from within themselves. In the simple and natural processes of creation, there is no dissonance. There is the dance of light, the magnificent harmony of the spheres, and the very processes of creation are the ultimately natural actions of things. Therefore, the inevitable and spontaneous fulfillment of the purpose for existence is harmonic, is beautiful, is orderly. We gain another concept from this thinking in connection with the first chapter of St. John where we find that in the beginning was the word. The word or fiat, the creative tonality, which we find returning again and again in religious and philosophical systems, in the mantrams or sacred chantings of tones, and in the garlands of letters of yoga and tantra, we have the recognition that creation is sustained by a great harmonic principle and that the universe is composed, as the Greeks uh, pointed out, of number, color, and form. That all things move according to these laws. Actually, the six as the symbol
symbol of creation is appropriately a symbol of harmony. For there is not a star which thou beholdest, but in its orbit like an angel thing, hymning to the young-eyed cherubim. Always this great Pythagorean overthought of the tremendous harmonic of creation. The creation was a song. The creation was a magnificent unfoldment of tonal beauty that actually whirled with the songs of angels and that everything that grows and lives is in some way the lengthened shadow of a song. That Pythagoras was a musician, that he had the sensitivity of the musical consciousness we know, and we can understand why to him, as to Bach, mountains were set in peace, and various changes of climate and temperature, storms and wind and waves, were points and counterpoints. These things were all part of one tremendous rhythm. A man listening, as Pythagoras did, for the tone of nature, the great cone of China, the inevitable song that extends and expands and goes on forever. He realizes with Pythagoras that this whole universe is maintained because of a great tonal vibration. Also that everything that lives has a tone, a keynote. Caruso was able to break glasses by sticking them with his finger and then singing the tone until the glass broke. Glasses and other fragile instruments can be broken by the tolling of a bell. And uh, from the tuning fork, we realize how sounds are carried and can be picked up. Pythagoras, marching with his disciples through cities, played upon his lute the keynote of the great architectural building pattern, declaring that every piece of symmetrical architecture was built around a musical form or pattern. And that if this keynote was emphasized in a peculiar way, the building would fall, even as the walls of Jericho fell when the trumpet sounded, uh, when the tribes of Israel led the sacred covenant around the walls of Jericho. So the universe was a great mystery of harmony. And Pythagoras went further to point out that man, seeking the universe, seeking his re-identification with the universe, much like in the philosophy of Lao Tzu, must approach by means of harmony, by the harmonic proportions of his own soul, man was able to hear the music of the spirit, by the mysterious sound, silences and quietudes of his own consciousness. He was able or could become aware of the great tone, the great universal note which sustained all things. Thus creation was indeed the blazing forth of sound around which forms were gathered, and every living thing is a sound embodied in a form. These thoughts all relate to the mystery of the number six which to Pythagoras represented, therefore, the whole mystery of harmony, the whole concept of man's ability uh, to bring himself into harmonic. And we have the harmonics of good and evil. We have the harmonics of ignorance and wisdom. And today we are beginning to recognize the importance of the therapeutic value of sound and harmony in connection with sickness. 
we know that when we speak of harmony, we speak of several things. For in a mysterious way, we use one word to cover two grand ideas. One of these covers the concept of sound. The other, the concept of integration. When we say a person is harmonious, we do not necessarily mean that he is singing. Nor do we necessarily mean that we hear some sound coming from him. We mean by harmonious that there is no discord in his nature, that he is a concordant person, and that therefore his whole nature is a melody, a melody of conduct, a melody of natural motions and emotions, a melody of synchronized parts of function. At the same time, we use the term harmony to represent an advanced form of musical composition, one of the last and greatest forms to be developed. Because we recognize in music three degrees also. We recognize the basic principle of rhythm, which is perhaps the oldest form of music that we know, largely the result of primitive percussion in the drum and things of that nature. Then we recognize melody, which is a continuous story unfolding in tone. We know the Greeks at the time of Pythagoras sang only by melody, and that also that they had no essential keys as we know them, nor did they train their voices in any harmonic arrangement. As one old writer points out, they all sang the same words at the same time, and they sang according to the convenience of their voices. Now that uh, might or might not be particularly delightful to us at the moment. They made no effort to agree as to the key or pitch. They simply spoke musically or with the concept. But Pythagoras does receive considerable credit as having introduced the concept of harmony, although it languished for a long time thereafter and did not have immediate recognition. But harmony represents intervals and the recognition of intervals, producing uh, such things as the diapente, the diacessaron, and things of that kind. The intervals of music that are harmonic and enharmonic. This also tells us that harmony has to do with the knowledge of intervals. And this again has to do with the ordering and the sequencing of various attitudes. Harmony in music is the ability of two things essentially different to unite to produce a common concept. Thus, individuals thinking and living according to the conveniences of their temperament may still unite to form a harmonic composition. In other words, things can be harmonic that are not identical. And by the very laws of harmony, these differences under discipline enrich the tapestry of tones and make the entire work more interesting, more advanced, and more spiritually satisfying. All these are rules and laws, then, that come under the heptad, but uh, under the hexad, but we must now go on to the heptad, which is the archetypal form or power of the number seven. Pythagoras gives us many key words. But they are all, I think, summarized in one law. Number seven is the number of the law. Now, by law, the Pythagoreans meant that celestial integration of process which 
constitute the inevitable pattern of conduct for all things. In other words, the will of deity is revealed through law. And the way of heaven is given to man through the laws of nature. That which in itself speaks not in words that man can hear, reveals itself by conduct, and law is the conduct of God. To the Pythagoreans, therefore, law is the forever revealing book of truth. Laws are of two kinds, divine and natural. Divine laws are those which reside archetypally in the divine being. Natural laws are the reflection of divine law, conditioned within a kind of substance or material, through which all of universal or divine law may not be perceived or apprehended. Only a part of the great law is embodied. The rest remains in its own nature. That part which is unembodied in matter, however, may be embodied in soul and in spirit. Therefore, man advancing from a material state to a psychic state may move under the administration of laws previously unknown but forever existing. Law is also referred to by the Pythagoreans as the will of God, because by means of law we become aware of the divine will to be itself, to fulfill, or to relentlessly and inevitably consummate its own purpose. For man, therefore, there is no release from law. The universe is lawful. And man, in order to attain to any state of security, must keep the law. Now, in addition to those laws which arise in God and nature, there are laws which are formulated by man himself for the administration of his own society. Most of the great codes of laws have originated in revelation or mystical or religious work. The earliest codes that we have, such as those of Hammurabi, are accredited to deities, and it is believed that they were revealed to prophets and patriarchs and great lawgivers of ancient times. The human history of law is largely derived from the records of things traditionally observed. Most so-called spiritual revelations of law are accumulations of human experience sanctified by time and demonstrated by utility. Thus, even man-made law is only the shadow of his observation of universal law. Now, in the course of time, however, man's civilization becoming more and more artificial and complicated, there has been an increase of statutes, and many persons, not themselves equipped to contemplate the universe, have found themselves either forced or inspired to amend the legal code. The result is today that laws are not always in accordance with heavenly law or universal law. And so the early Christian church divided man-made law from divine law, declaring that to break a man-made law is a crime, to break a divine law is a sin. A sin being an act against God, a crime an act against man, or against the common good of man. 
Now, if we go back to our book of Genesis, we find that on the seventh day, the Lord rested and set aside the Sabbath. And in the Kabbalah, the Sabbath becomes what is termed the center of the direction. The universe was recognized in ancient times as having six directions. North, east, south, west, up, down. These directions all came from a central point, and this central point was called the Sabbath, or the Great Throne, and power moving into objectivity from itself, extended in six directions from its own nature. And these six directions later became the six faces of a cube and were so symbolized in the Pythagorean symbolism. These six directions and the center exhausted the potential manifestation of power. Therefore, they represented law or motion. Because to the Greeks, law was also a movement. It was a motion of energy according to its own nature. And when we say according to its own nature, we say law. For this is accord with self, or accord with the essential reality of a thing. According to the Pythagoreans, no natural energy ever broke its own law or tried to. Because in the world of energy, laws or powers are inevitable. It is only in a sphere of individualized intellectual entities that the, even the concept of disobedience is possible. All disobedience is a limited condition, however, for disobedience can never actually achieve magnitude in itself. Well, things moving according to their own natures are considered lawful. And in this concept of law, we also have the recognition that the divine law, as a manifestation of the divine will, constitutes the secondary definition of good. Therefore, good and God are of the same origin in the old Anglo-Saxon. And good is that state of a thing existing according to itself. This is perhaps a mysterious statement, but when we say a thing existing according to itself, we mean without conflict with its own essential nature. The universe exists without conflict. It is. Therefore, it is good. It therefore has no possibility of being amended. And no matter what we conceive or how we think or what we believe, we cannot be better than that natural good which is. Man can achieve unity with good, but he cannot surpass it inasmuch as good is perfect order, and no thing can be more than perfect. The will of deity in law and order is thus manifested most perfectly in the great process of creation. So creation is the unfoldment of the great flower of law. And within this flower, enthroned as the Buddhic figure within the cosmic lotus, is the lawmaker, forever throned upon the magnitude of its own manifestation. It is also called the symbol of the creative number because it is through law and the works of law that the Creator is most evident to the creation. 
that which has observed the creation has seen the creator in his work. Now the reason why the number seven is also associated with rest or with equilibrium is because equilibrium in itself is the secret of the law. Uh, the equilibrium of the universe is its primary law and its extension from this into manifestation gives us the Pythagorean formula of the unmoved mover. The six directions are the motions of number. The seventh direction, so-called, is the center. And this is the unmoved point of motion. Law is therefore the unmoved moving in its six inevitable directions. This is law because there are no other directions. Therefore, beyond law and beyond lawfulness, there is nothing. It is impossible for law to escape from law because law fills all of law. There is no place for the lawful to escape to and therefore the number is said to represent that the law keeps itself, and therefore is the perfect example of lawfulness. There is also the interesting and mysterious idea of this central point of equilibrium, or the unmoved. Law exists only as a result of the motions of being. Therefore, if the motion of being ceases and all things created return again to the root, law is said to sleep. Law rests because it cannot exist apart from manifestation. Law is motion and things unmoved. Therefore, alone transcend law. And the central point of transcendence represents also the point of synthesis. God in its own nature is one. God in manifestation is six. God, the nature plus the manifestation equals seven, which is the exhaustion of the creative power of number. Now I hope that that is clear. Anyway, we must now go on to the next symbol, which is the Ogdoad, or the Eight. Now the Eight was conceived by the Pythagoreans to represent the striving of the two serpents that were twisted around the caduceus of Hermes. But the Eight is also the peculiar psychical motion of the magnetic whole of the earth. It is therefore a curious endless band which crosses itself in the middle and goes on and on. In the tarot card it is represented for the strange tilted brim of the hat of the juggler. It is the symbol of continuous unbroken motion. Therefore, we are not surprised to find the Pythagorean key word for the number eight is love. Now, we wonder why it should be so decided or so considered. So let us analyze for a moment the concept of the number eight, which is a, an endless band turned upon itself. It is not merely the serpent with a tail in its mouth, the symbol of eternity. It is the symbol composed of two apparent circles formed by one circle. So let us see why the number eight was so represented by the Greeks. Of course, 
the number eight, is a number which, if divided, gives us two fours, which, if in turn divided, gives us two twos, which, if in turn divided, gives us two ones. Therefore, the number eight is called a number reducible to unity because it is susceptible of an equal division into ones, which many numbers are not. The three, for example, cannot be divided equally into ones, unless you want to say three ones. But when you divide it, you do not get unity. You get a one and a two. But in the number eight, you have a complete division. A half of eight is four, a fourth of eight is two, an eighth of eight is one. Four plus two plus one equals seven. Therefore, we find the reestablishment of the law, and we suddenly discover that we have a septenary concealed within the eight, and which the eight exceeds. We also recognize the eight as a number, two out of three of the divisions of which give us even numbers, because the half is four, the fourth is two. Both of these are passive numbers. But the final division restores the sacred number, the uneven number, one. Now, what has all this got to do with love? That is a rather <laughs> tricky and technical question. So the Pythagoreans began to study the nature of love in an effort to observe its function in the universal law. And in the course of their discovery, uh, they either discovered or were told or in one way found out that the number eight was the great secret number of the Eleusinian mysteries. The number of the great mother of mysteries. The number of Isis and Diana, the great goddess of the Athenians. <clears throat> Thus, the number eight to them represented concord. It represented not a union of forms, as in the case of the number six, which is a union of two triangles, but a union of infinities, because it is a union of two spheres, or circles. The circle being a symptom or symbol of infinity, or an infinite number of parts. Therefore, the union of infinite becomes much more significant and important numerically than the, than the union of forms, bodies, or forces. The number eight begins to represent then what the, what the Platonists later described as the eight forms of amity. And we find the Greeks in their own legislative system, represented or recognized eight forms of relationship between things. And these eight forms, to them, all represented kinds of regard, affection, <coughs> or love. Things which are outwardly divided by form cannot outwardly coalesce. Therefore, in order that any form of themselves integrated and separated can unite, a binder must be introduced of some kind. And in alchemy, this binder was mercury, the universal solvent. Gold and silver could not meet, except that both be dissolved in mercury. Everywhere in nature, there has to be a universal solvent by means of which things not naturally 
materially compatible can still be brought to identity or to a relative degree of union. To the Greeks, the universal solvent was love. They recognized it as that power which could alone hold things together, which had not yet the power to hold themselves together. If man, for example, could experience identity with another creature and could know himself and that other creature to be one, we would have an entirely different concept of relationship. Christ said, I and my Father are one. Man can say this, but he cannot experience it. He cannot know it. Therefore, where the individual may not know that he is God, the religious systems of the world tell him, therefore, to love God, and that through the love which he bestows upon God, he builds a bridge between God and himself. And in life, for man, the union of divided parts is through the bridge of human regard, affection, and respect. Now the eighth is composed of two fours. And we have already recognized from our study of the four, or uh, the tetrad, that the four represents the divine power involved in the creative process. In other words, the Lord of the material world, and also that part of man which is involved in the psychic mystery of generation. A four may likewise then be considered equivalent to the human psyche in the sense that it represents the demiurgus or secondary creator for as the universe creates the soul, so the soul in turn engenders the body, fashions it, forms it, and molds it into the likeness of itself. Therefore, an ensouled body, whether it be the solar system or a minute atom, all ensouled bodies are tetrads, because four is also the least number of surfaces that can enclose an area. Thus, any human being is a tetrad, a body and soul. The Abduad becoming the symbol of two ensouled bodies, therefore becomes the number of sympathy. Inasmuch as two ensouled bodies have all essential qualities in likeness or in similarity, all creatures, we will say then, are ensouled bodies. Yet having this great identity of fact in common, they cannot get along. They cannot recognize that in all essentials they are one, and that what we call diversity is entirely of matters not essential or essentially real. Yet by diversity we are infinitely separated. And this separation or self-centeredness of being would ultimately lead to the final destruction. For all things, to the degree that they become isolated, separate themselves from the common energies of their kind and perish. Man, therefore, from the beginning, has been afraid of isolation. He has striven in every way possible to create bridges between himself and others. Not only that he may understand, but that he may be understood 
both processes being equally important to him. The Ogdoad, then, represents two creations of a similar essential nature, which have been brought together and bound by an endless circuit of energy, forming the mysterious number eight in form. Thus, the eight is the symbol of those overtones of regard, those subtle energies of consciousness by which the individual uh, seeks to perfect self through the experience of association and also attempts to escape from that isolation which means the inability of the self to function. The Greeks recognized that man's selfless has two essential functions. One is the expression of itself through its own organism. And the second is the extension of that expression to the, uh, of self to the circumference of society. In other words, the person not only wishes uh, in a sense, to control himself, but he wishes to control others. He wishes to extend his psychic field beyond the circumference of his own body. He wishes to exert influence, which, moving from him, permeates other things, changing them, altering them, modifying them, influencing, controlling them, and perhaps even destroying them. This motion of influence from each person therefore becomes the basis of conflict. For conflict is not a struggle of bodies, but a struggle of psyche moving through bodies and moving out to the degree that they become inhibiting upon each other. And therefore, we have the battles of wits and of minds and the struggles of ambition and things of this nature. Eight because it is a balanced number, because it is an ordered number, indicates a natural and placid association. It is also a passive number or a negative number, which would imply and infer, therefore, that the virtues which it represents are not virtues of aggression, but virtues of receptivity. Therefore, we say that love seeks not for itself, but for others, and is not a force moving primarily toward self, but from self. And as we study along in psychology and human relationships, we find the individual who loves himself seldom finds any satisfaction in the emotion. To the degree that we center our regards upon ourselves, we are impoverished. To the degree that we bestow them, we enrich ourselves. Passive numbers, therefore, represent indirect methods and would be appropriate to a term like happiness, which can never be the result of a particular effort, but must be the consequence or reaction of things. Therefore, love is a reactive power, the individual growing by what he gives and not by what he has. Love to the philosophical group in the Greek problem that represents many levels of affection, extending from friendship through various types of personal regard, through various divisions of affection as the love of child for parent, the love of parent for child, the love of man for country, the love of man and woman, the love of beauty, the love of virtue, the love of good, the love of truth, the love of wisdom, the love of God. These are all degrees of affection. And strangely enough, all affections of this kind are distantly but inevitably possessive. 
that which we love we instinctively possess and only lose when we become aware of our possessiveness. We continue to possess until we say so. Then we lose. We continue to possess until we demand, and then we destroy, because the number is passive. It cannot do in the form of a direct action. A man can w w uh, earn wisdom but he cannot carefully plan a career toward love. The Greeks, therefore, agree with most other systems that the term love is essentially undefinable. To define it is to defile it. To rationalize it is to destroy it. It represents an intangible and is the presence of a strange and elusive God, according to the Greeks who appears and disappears at will, takes innumerable forms, and yet wherever he appears, uh, bestows great goodness, beauty, and glory. For to the Greeks, the God of love was also the inspirer of art, the perfecter of philosophy, and the greatest cause of civilization the world can possibly imagine. It was also the number of initiation into the Eleusinian mysteries, because in these mysteries man approaches the experience of the love of pure truth. And the mysteries were institutions of love, inasmuch as the purpose of growth is to learn to love reality. Not merely to understand, but with an ardor of the spirit to cast oneself toward the object of affection. In the Song of Solomon the King, therefore, we find the three great divisions of love, as it was sung also in the mystic songs of the troubadours and the minstrels, and is to be found in the um, raptures of the dervishes and the Sufis and other Eastern mystics. Solomon says in the beginning of the song, My beloved is mine. In the middle part of the great song, he says, My beloved is mine, and I am my beloved. In the last high note of the song, he cries out, I am my beloved. Emotion from selfishness to unselfishness. And this, according to the Greeks, was the great motion by which things separated outwardly can still find union and can experience above the illusion of separation. So the eighth is a binding of things by their principles and by their essence. And from such bindings also are generations produced because the production of love are beauty and beauty is a great goddess that cannot die. So the next number that we consider is the Aeneas, or the power of the number nine, or the inverted six. Now in the Pythagorean system, the number nine is called the number of limitation. Now there are many reasons why it is so designated. For one thing, as is rather obvious, that the nine immediately falls short of the ten, which is the complete cycle of number. Therefore, it means to fall short. Nine is the number of man, because it is the number of the generative cycle of nine months, which was recognized by the angels. In other words, the prenatal epic of man it consists of nine symbolic months. And also, in the same Iliocinian and Sabasian rites among the Greeks, the lesser mysteries, or the degrees of the lesser rites, were nine in number, to represent the human being in his prenatal existence. 
Man, therefore, is a creature who has fallen short. And in the ancient language, if we go back into the root of words, the word that we call sin means to fall short. Um, sin does not mean primarily an act of violence against God. It means, in some way, to fall short of sufficient. The sinner, therefore, is the imperfect one, that which has not yet achieved consummation. Therefore, to be born in sin and conceived in iniquity meant originally nothing more than to be born imperfect. The rest of it was a little theological dressing to make it sound more formidable. <laughs> But man falls short. And there are many symbolisms explaining this falling short. The human being exists within the womb of nature, which is symbolized in ancient times for the zodiac. The zodiac at one time consisted of ten signs of 36 degrees each. Later, the compound sign of Virgo Scorpio was broken and the sign of Liber or Equilibrium was placed between. We still find the trace of this in the similarity of the form of the two signs, Virgo and Scorpio, and also in the setting up of the scales of Amentet in Libra, part of the old mystery ritual of the balance, equilibrium between the two great arcs of the universe. But in the Greek system, the concept of the twelve divisions of the zodiac was also known at the time of Pythagoras and generally accepted. And we find that man is therefore nine twelfths of a circle. He, is, he requires for his prenatal epic nine twelfths of a year. And as he lies in embryo form, his body occupies nine twelfths of a circle. In the same way, the Greeks believe that the human brain is nine twelfths of a sphere. All these symbolisms, while they may or may not be sustained historically or, you will say, uh, physiologically, are still of interest to us. So why do we, what do we find that from a very early time there were three sets or degrees of the state mystery introduced to make possible the complete birth of man? In the ancient wisdom teachings, therefore, man is born by nine months of generation and three degrees of initiation. The broken wheel being mended by the ritual or rite. For so the silver cord is loosened and the wheel is broken at the system. The broken wheel, which occurs very often in early religious symbolism, is this symbol of imperfection, the incomplete being, the nine twelfth creature. Now, number nine is also the symbol of limitation, because according to the Greeks, imperfection exists throughout matter, and the created universe, which is the archetype for man, man being the microcosm, the world being the macrocosm, is also itself nine twelfths of creation, or of a creative power. The Pythagoreans recognized this also by establishing nine levels or layers of the mundane world. They recognized, after the Egyptians, the universe or solar system or world, they used these terms rather interchangeably in those days, as symbolized by the cross section of an onion with its concentric circles, 
one inside of the other. And in this cross-sectioning, uh, which is incidentally the same concept of the universe that appears in Dante and in Milton, the layers are nine in number, the lowest of them being the Earth, above which are the seven orbits of the planets, making eight, and then the ninth, which is the sphere of the fixed stars. A a circle surrounding the rest. Therefore, according to Plato, <coughs> souls coming into generation fell from the sphere of the six stars, descended through the orbits of the planets, and finally entered the earth or the crop or the cup, the vessel which receives these. Man is therefore represented by them as eight plus one or nine. Eight being the symbol of principles and the ninth of the depository or cup, the crocor, which receives principles, being the physical form or body. Man is therefore eightfold in his complete superphysical construction. And to this is ended or added body, which is the receptacle of principles but is not itself a principle. Man thus combined or formed together is the symbol of this imperfect pattern, this unbalanced structure, this wheel which cannot turn and cannot support the load for which it was intended. The wheel, incidentally, was not only by the Greeks, but also by the Mayas and aspects of Central America, regarded as a symbol of imperfection. And no wheel vehicle was used in America prior to the coming of the Spaniards. They considered it a symbol of ill luck or of evil. They declared that when the wheel came, civilization would die. Well, we've got a few wheels around here. I don't know whether it has... It has uh, brought about the problem that we know the wheels within wheels can be dangerous. The nine is a symbol of man because it was also associated with a positive pole of generation. Man not only has these nine uh, tenths or nine twelfths of a completeness, but according to the ancients, he had nine bodily orifices he had nine essential systems of bodily structure, and throughout all of his development, there was a repetition of the cycle of nine. The combination of nine and six equals the sign of cancer, by the way, which is the symbol of generation in the zodiac. Man, therefore, represents a generating power, which lacks the completeness or the fullness of regenerating capacity. Man as nine must therefore be subject to salvation because in some way he is imperfect. The Chinese carry this symbolism to quite a degree because whenever they produce a work of art, they intentionally make a flaw so that it shall not be said that they aspire to the perfection which peculiarly belongs to heaven. And when the Japanese painter and sculptor Kobo Daishi, one of the founders of the great Shingonshu, one of the great divisions of Buddhism in Japan, was making the dragons on the top of the gate of a temple, he, he did so beautifully that when he put the last drop paint exactly where it belonged, the dragons began to move. He was so perfect that he had bestowed life, and therefore, with the quickness of mind for which he was always justly distinguished, he took a little paint of the wrong color and put it on, and immediately the dragons returned to wood again. A nice symbolism, but implying or suggesting this idea that man, were he complete, would indeed be a god, and that the universe could, so to say, come completely to life in him, 
But there is something lacking, something mysterious, like the mysterious ingredient for the philosopher's stone, which the alchemist sought everywhere but could never find. And this imperfection is the key to humanity. And therefore, the number nine, which incidentally also <coughs> was an important number because it contained three triads. And these three triads uh, were themselves symbolic of the nature of man, who has a threefold spiritual nature, a threefold psychic nature, and a threefold body. Thus he has everything except the cord to string them together with, and that remains until another number. Man has all the faculties, but he is now struggling struggling desperately for the establishment of that which is missing. And that is what the modern psychologist likes to term integration. Oneness to bind them together. Man is still a creature divided because his mind needs the one to make it a unit, to make it a oneness again. So we are not surprised then that the decad or the number ten is called by Pythagoras what? Faith. And that is only one of the names, however, which he gave it. Not faith. Faith. F-A-I-T-H. Because it is the object of all human sincere contemplation. The decad is called the triumph of number. It is number which having moved from unity to diversity establishes a new kind of integration. It is the achievement of the unity of totality. For the ten becomes the symbol of the whole tetractus or the sum of number. As the one is a symbol of indivisible unity, the ten is the symbol of achieved, attained unity. Uh, the final consummation of all things in the perfection of themselves is ten. <coughs> Because to the Pythagoreans, <coughs> ten equals perfection, which in turn equals unity. For in their thinking, all things to be perfect must be established in a state of indivisible oneness. A perfect mind must be absolutely unified. A perfect society must be a perfect unit. Everything must be a unit, and by unity, not a compelled unit, but an attained unit. The ten, therefore, is the voluntary association of numbers, and their consummation in the reestablishment of a concept of totality. Now, how does man at this stage think this through. How is he to envision a totality which he cannot experience? Every human being merely is looking toward something more than he is. He is seeking peace, security, happiness, sufficiency. All of these things are different from the one inasmuch as they are achieved unities, or the cycle of the one passing through diversity and reaffirming itself. So the cipher becomes a symbol of the cycle, or the motion by means of which things return to themselves. But the addition of the cipher to the unit makes this unit the appropriate archetypal form 
for the tetrapta, so the ten dots, for it is the sum of all number, and any number absent results in the loss of the ten. Nor can there be any essential number above the ten. For ten, says Pythagoras, exhausts the diversity of number. As man, through the experience of living, exhausts the diversity of experience. And when you have experienced everything, what have you? Unity. There is nothing else you can have. When you know everything, you know one thing. Because everything is merely a phase of one thing. There are not ten wisdoms in the world. There is one wisdom with ten ways of reaching it. But no matter how you travel, no matter what you learn, you can only exhaust diversity. And when you have realized that, you have achieved the consciousness of absolute unity. So unity in the sense of ten is the exhaustion of all numbers. And the numbers are like uh, in the old legend, are represented by rivers, which flowing down all meet in the number ten, which represents the sea. And the number ten, of course, is a potential one, because the sun will raise the water from the sea, carry it in the clouds, drop it on the mountains, where it will become many streams, and will kindly come, finally come back and converge again into the sea. So the journey from the sea to the sea is the journey from the one to the ten. And it is infinitely repeated. But Plotinus calls it the journey of that which is alone, the one, to that which is alone is, the sea. The drop of water and the sea are both unity. So the number ten, having fulfilled all things, is considered the archetypal number, of course, of adeptship, or of the perfection of everything that can be perfected or achieved by man. In every department of life, the ten is the beginning plus the method or the means or the intervals and the end, which is in the beginning. And in the great Egyptian glyph of Raphael Nilus, this is the serpent with a tail in his mouth. Because all things are moving in this eternal cycle. Thus Pythagoras, affirming the basis of his entire mathematical system, also established for us the concept of the decimal system, by which all things are measured in terms of ten. And in this basic concept, we think, we do not know, that perhaps mankind developed the idea from the ten fingers, which he first used in counting. And there is the old story, you know, that when he had to get to eleven, he had to take a shoe off. <laughs> there was the concept of the ten, and the ten in the Kabbalah, of course, was composed of two fives, which were the hands. The placing of the hands in certain Jewish rituals represents the union of these two fives, which in turn represents the two tablets of the law, each containing five of the commandments. So the ten commandments, which constitute the law and the prophets, is another statement of the completeness or fulfillment of universal laws in the Decad. And the Decad was completed originally by the old legend, inasmuch as the inscription on one tablet of the law was raised, 
and the inscription on the other tablet of the law was engraved into the tablet, so that when the two tablets met, the raised and the sunken part united, forming one absolutely solid pattern. This, of course, represented the union of the positive and negative principles, or the polarized concept of law and order, or law and the prophet or the old and the new dispensation, and all that has to do with it. Now the addition of one to nine equals the ten. Therefore the number one added to the nine becomes also a messianic symbol, and is so represented in nearly all religious systems. Because there appears the intercessor, the comforter, the sotar, the messiah, who in each life plays the part of the one to make the nine ten. He is available, or this power is forever supplementing the nine to make the ten. And is so recognized in the Jewish uh, metaphysical system and also in the Christian Kabbalah of the Middle Ages. The ten then we have now as the symbol of the completeness of the wholeness or the fullness of a thing. The numbers have fulfilled their part, they have been added together, and out of the addition of the first four numbers is restored the number one again. Because the number one is the first part of the ten. Now the Pythagoreans and other numerologists after them have taken another attitude, namely that you take your compound number for example, and you add these numbers to find again your basic unity according to the Gamatria and the Notaricum of the Kabbalists. Thus, for instance, if you have a number 25, you take the 2, add it to the 5, and you have 7, and you go back to your basic pattern again. So all numbers above 10 are reducible to numbers under 10. The general exception in some systems is that two numbers, 11 and 22, are not reduced. These have to do with certain key letters of the Jewish alphabet. But it is normal, for instance, to take a number above 10 and add the parts of it to produce another number. That's 34, you add together, you have 7. 29 becomes 11. And that number you do not reduce, but leave it 11. Thus, in all these systems, you have some other interesting problems that appear. Now, when we come to the study of certain numbers, we find other habits about them that are interesting. The number 5 multiplied by itself will always have itself as in the final term of the multiplication. Five fives are 25. And any of them, these, this number, or the number six multiplied by itself, will always have the number six. Six sixes are thirty-six, and the number is recur returned, or is recurred. Now, by this process, what do we have? We have here one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven plus eight plus nine plus ten. And if you add them all together, you get 55, and add those, you get 10 again. 5 and 5 equal 10. And so you go, and you find these numbers are infinitely repeating formulas. And these formulas are the things that to the Pythagoreans reveal the infinite power of number. Now there is one use which they all made, and which we have totally lost, in which they did combine letters and numbers for a certain purpose. Thus, for example, when they wished to conceal an energy, universal power, or agency under a name, they would select for that name one the sum of which numerically would be equal to the power intended. This was done by a particular process. 
Therefore, the Gnostics took the deity Abraxas, which was their god of the cycle. And the Greek number system associated with the letters is such that the numerical power of Abraxas is 365, which is the symbol of the year. They frequently made use of this type of symbolism. Therefore, the number 666, which is associated in Revelation with the beast, is the sum of the numerical value of the Greek word which means the lower intellect. Thus, they used words and numbers to indicate particular meanings in order that each of these meanings might be meaningful and obvious through a Kabbalah or through a method. Thus, according to Pythagoras, to take the names of any of the Greek deities, take their numerical equivalent, and you can reduce them on the Tetractus to the power on which they stand. This is because these names were selected by the ancient authors with this purpose in mind. And the Egyptian system upon which it was built was much earlier than Greek civilization, although Pythagoras was the first to publicly describe it. Thus all, perhaps, of the admonitions that we find in the book of Revelation, for instance, are meaningful. For it calls a particular spiritual penalty upon anyone who shall change the spelling of a single name. And no one knows why. But it was because of this analogy between the meanings of letters and of uh, the power of number. Thus, letters were associated with number in this way. But I think you will see that thus, in this application, we are not necessarily dealing with a problem of divination. We are dealing with a cipher by means of which we can substitute letters for numbers and in that way create words which are appropriate names for things and yet which do not necessarily have the meaning that we first suspect. with an excellent manner for making a concealment of some kind, which could go back to the science of numbers. This was used a great deal in the Old Testament, where many names are merely very carefully concealed mathematical formulas. So by these formulas, you get another way of reaching into the mystery involved, or the idea behind uh, the use of certain letters. So in general, that is what we can cover in connection with this concept of number. Uh, those of you who are interested in going further with it, you will find a section in our book on symbolical philosophy devoted to this, and with a fairly complete development of the basic number patterns as recorded by Fiona Smyrna. For those who are intrigued beyond this point in their study of the Pythagorean theory of number, uh, I believe one of the best available texts, although it is a difficult one, and uh, very scarce, it can be consulted here in our library, and that is Higgins' great work, The Anaclysis. Uh, this uh, work shows a great deal of research into Pythagorean number. Uh, many secret societies, incidentally, that survive today have numerical symbols which can uh, be reinterpreted in terms of letters and back and forth. These things become an interesting problem. Dionysus describes the Logos, or the great figure, blazing in light with, the, with every letter of the Greek alphabet located on some part of its body. And, of course, Pythagoras tells us that his own name, which was not his real name, that the name Pythagoras contains within its numerical and letter powers the entire secret of his doctrine. It was never left in any other form. 
So this is the philosophy of number. And for those who wish to extend the research, it can be a very intriguing problem.